the most complicated simulations that are currently being done in the world are, are being done using the Dirac computers. Dirac stands for Distributed Research Using Advanced Computing and it is a national facility for theoretical astrophysics and particle physics and it is based in Leicester, Cambridge, Durham and Edinburgh and we have five different machines at those four locations. The node that's at Leicester has about four and a half thousand uh, computing cores and so a typical family computer might have four of those cores so immediately we're a thousand times more powerful in terms of the number of cores but the real thing that makes us more powerful is the way the computer is connected together so it's what we do with those cores they are uh, it's called an all-to-all -all cluster so it has a lot more connections between the individual cores on the system so that they can talk to each other much better so if you just took a thousand home computers and put them all in a room, they wouldn't be nearly as powerful as the system that we have here. These are compute nodes. Okay. Storage is down here. So there's some storage. There's a bit more storage. These are basically highly efficient parallelized file system storage. Um, because we've got however many of these compute plates and you've got potentially 32 jobs I think it is running on each of them and each of them could be wanting to access files on here so although it's presented as looking like a big hard drive if you like it's far far more efficient and far greater performance than just a hard drive. So specific science questions need different types of computer architecture. We call the Leicester node the complexity system and the reason is we're looking at some of the most complex physical systems in the universe. Each of the nodes they're all housed in uh, chassis and out of them come lots of communication cables and that's really the heart of what makes it such a powerful computer is all of these communication cables between the different nodes. This is a broken one so I'm not too bothered about the uh, static electricity. So we've got a local disk, hard disk there with the operating system on there. Scientists or researchers would submit jobs to the job scheduler which get run on one of these, uh, these compute nodes. Whenever these are booted up that's reconfigured. There's a lot of them here so it's potentially a lot of work keeping this going but the system is very cleverly configured so I could take that out, throw it away, put a new one in, slot it back in, turn it on and within 10 minutes it will be booted up, reconfigured. Um, by the system and back in action. So we're not wasting time poking around, fiddling about with the operating system. It's running scientific Linux Red Hat. Under there we've got heat sinks with the CPUs further down under there. I mean, does it mm -hmm. go wrong very often? No, no, we've been, it's been a very stable system. Um, and so we've had occasional minor uh, issues with uh, individual cores, but very, very few of them have had to be replaced. So it's been very stable. The system will tell us that this is broken, we swap it out, we've got pretty much next day uh, delivery for complete, complete node is gone. Push it back in, uh, as I say, within 10 minutes it'll be back up and, and in action again. And uh, it comes here, it's allowing for Yes, it does. Because you can never, you can never find an Allen key when you want one. <laughs> it's really just a computer, I mean in some ways it's not so different from the computer on your desktop. Um, the networking is different, there are more than one network connection and there's InfiniBand and a control network and so on. The chassis is 16. At the flick of a switch or a, a virtual switch we can turn an entire chassis off or that chassis and that chassis or all the chassis or individual blades. Again, it's, um, it's the, the clever bit really is the, the software that's used to control it. If you had an orchestra with lots and lots of instruments, you've still got the conductor at the front who's kind of keeping everyone doing what they need to do. That's what the login nodes do. So they make sure that they keep track of which cores are working. If any, any of them breaks, the login nodes will know about it. And there, it's the login nodes where the scheduler runs 
for everybody's simulation. So if I want to start a simulation, I put it in the queue and it's the login nodes control where it's going to go. And they'll also make sure that it has access to the right amount of memory. I have to make sure the data at the end are transferred to somewhere safe because at the end, the computer will just shut down the, uh, shut down the job and it'll wipe the RAM. These two run the control software. So this is where the jobs are scheduled and these are a failover pair, so one of them, the active one, which is head three at the moment, if that fails, everything will fail over straight to head four. The database is replicated between them, so we're not crippled if that happens. It'll be full right now. Uh, we can have a look at the scheduler and see who's doing what. I've logged into one of the head nodes here. So um, this is what basically what a user would see when they log in. And we can see the jobs here that people are running. Um, here you go. Running. There, that's one of our PhD students. Uh, that's another, that's one of my PhD students. So there's a, a lot of work going on. This simulation here, the cache one, that's looking at a small galaxy around the Milky Way and looking at what happens when a supernova, so when a star explodes, what that does to the gas distribution in that galaxy. So what Claire is doing is some simulations of that in the very early universe. And do you know how long that'll take? The job is actually running on 16 processors at the moment so although it's only a two-hour job it's using because it's using 16 processors that equates to 32 hours of cpu time but it's only taking two hours of real time so, so you're getting results back much quicker so that's the speed of a supercomputer it's basically the, the parallelization yeah so what you'll get is the we'll be able to make movies of what's happening but the really interesting thing is to study the properties of the gas and how that changes with time because we want to understand we want to look at the galaxies in the simulation and compare them to the real galaxies that we see around the milky way so we're trying to understand how stars form in those galaxies these are from the group in exeter who are running simulations of star formation and the movement of gas in a galaxy like the milky way so how the, the gas evolves in the disk of the Milky Way. How long will that one take then? Um, that one is nearly finished, but it will have taken a very long time. So these, these are long jobs. And the thing to notice is you have all of these jobs running at the same time. And given that there's about four, four and a half thousand cores, it means every one hour that the system is running, it's doing about 4,000 hours of work. So that, that's the speed up that you can get. Presumably those people could have more Yeah, but it's also a trade-off because if you spread the job too thinly, each core is not doing very much. So they spend too much time talking to each other and not enough time working. This sounds like every office I've ever worked in. I didn't want to say that. <laughs>So these kind of jobs would be impossible to do on a normal desktop because they would take so long to do each individual run that we wouldn't be able to understand what was going on.